Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's book talk about Hitler's Girl. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you for joining us today virtually. We hope that you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibition, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, from photographer Martin Scholler, running through June 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. We also appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. If you wanna get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat in addition to all the links I've mentioned. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Today we are honored to be joined by Lauren Young and Catherine Grace Katz. Lauren is an academic and policy consultant specializing in security and defense issues. She is a lecturer at Yale University, where she teaches in the Department of Political Science and the Jackson School for Global Affairs. She lives in New York City. Catherine is a writer and historian from Chicago. She holds degrees in history from Harvard and Cambridge and is currently pursuing her JD at Harvard Law School. She is also the author of The Daughters of Yalta. You can buy Hitler's Girl at the link in the chat. Um, thank you again for joining us today. And now I'm gonna hand things over to Lauren and Catherine. Thank you so much. It is so exciting to be here with you this evening, Lauren. I have been looking forward to this conversation for a while and I'm so excited that the day is finally here, but it's also really wonderful to be having this conversation and to discuss thought provoking issues in the context of our current times, especially given the pressures facing global democracy that feel in many ways like the 1930s, which is something I hope that we'll be able to talk about, but also crucially and very seriously, the rising tide of anti-Semitism over the last few years, which has probably only come to many people's attention, unfortunately, given recent remarks by people like Kanye West and Kyrie Irving. So with that backdrop, it's wonderful to have you here and to help enlighten some of those very important issues, and also to share a bit of this fascinating story and some of the incredibly compelling, intriguing, and some of the most terrible <laughs> figures from history uh, in your story, which really does offer all of that. So thank you so much. Um, I am so excited to, to get started. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and thank you to the Museum of Jewish Heritage for inviting me to speak today. And of course, to Catherine, who is an author in her own right of another wonderful book for taking part in this discussion with me. Well, Lauren, I love to get started by sharing a little bit of the story behind the story. So I was hoping that you could share a bit of the story behind this book with us, uh, behind Hitler's Girl and uh, all of the fascinating and compelling characters that you discovered. Well, it's a long story. <laughs> um, and it really starts with my professional career. You know, my interest, my academic interest and my work interest when I started, um, started out in this field um, some years ago with security and defense. And specifically, I worked um, quite a bit with the uh, issues surrounding nuclear nonproliferation. And as time went by and, you know, the world has developed as it has, it, it became clearer and clearer to me that nuclear weapons are problematic, um, but in many ways, democratic erosion is even more problematic. So I started looking at threats to democracy through a lens of um, threats to international peace and security, which is essentially my brief. Um, I've also taught for a long time and I've taught, um, lived in many years in England and taught at the London School of Economics, where, you know, we have much in common with the British Academy. We all speak the same language, but we think about things surprisingly differently. And I know, Catherine, you've spent a lot of time on, on, on these issues as well, um, this sort of cross-cultural 
um, lens of looking at, at, at political issues. And we teach a lot of, in England about the policy of appeasement. And it became really interesting to me to sort of look at it from the British angle. And from the British perspective, appeasement had, was quite successful in many ways. Um, it prevented Britain from entering the Second World War. Um, the British population writ large at the time really had no appetite for another war. They had lost a generation of young men um, in the First World War and militarily they were ill-equipped to fight another war. Um, so as Hitler became chancellor in 1933 and his aggressiveness um, started to accelerate, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement to keep Britain out of conflict at any cost on the surface makes a lot of sense. Um, but when I started to think about it and started digging around, um, particularly from the vantage point of today's world, um, the more I realized that this story of the positivity of the policy of appeasement wasn't really complete. Um, there was a lot more to it. And so as any good researcher does, I went to the archives and I found documents about the period that had been classified and reclassified. And fortuitously, a lot of the classifications were starting to roll off. And what I came across in my research was that there was an underside to appeasement that played out in Britain and in stories that were largely suppressed because of these classifications. And that this archival research that I had discovered uh, formed a very different picture of Britain during this period, challenging many familiar characterizations of Britain as the cornerstone of democratic traditions, which is what we've all always believed. And what I identified through my own research was that there were serious challenges to democracy during this period, and they were not met, met with sufficient resistance to the point where I do believe that democracy could have gone either way. So there was essentially a groundswell of support for Hitler, which I write about, um, amongst the British ruling classes and the future of democracy on the in the during the 1930s really turned on the head of a pin and the potential for Britain to succumb to Nazi Germany was a real possibility and in fact possibly even a probability um, that was advanced and nurtured by the country's elite and systematically covered up by the government as too dangerous to reveal even decades later. Well, specifically, one of the things that you emphasize in your book, which is so impactful and powerful, is that there was a, a real a seam of anti-Semitism that was widespread amongst the British upper class, of course, not the entirety of the upper class, but a number of very prominent and well-placed individuals that had significant voices, uh, not only socially, but also in government and politics. So I was hoping you could elaborate a bit more on that and why it's only now fully coming to light. Is it just a matter of the class, the classification that's falling away, or are there other forces that have made this especially timely and has revealed itself to you? You know, a combination probably of, uh, of both of your um, insightful comments. Um, you know, there's always been undercurrents of anti-Semitism present in most countries with Jewish communities, as we know, um, including Britain. Um, you know, I write in my book about the founding of Tel Aviv and the idea of Zionism was largely, wasn't just generated by Theodore Herzl, but was funded by wealthy British families who understood that, that Jewish people required a safe haven. And there's wonderful stories about how they went to Israel, these families, and placed stones on the beach marking the homesteads where they were going to live. Um, but like today, the emergence and tolerance of right-wing rhetoric during the 1930s was emboldening and brought bigotry out of the shadows in Britain, particularly during the 1930s um, and, and into the mainstream. And the connection, this connection between 
right-wing politics and anti-Semitism, I think is one that's always worth remembering. Absolutely. Well, before we get into some more of the general thematic trends, which I would love to talk to you about, these are things that I love to think about as a historian and law student, and that you know, you certainly, as we were chatting before, align with your uh, academic work. But before we get to that, I have to ask you about the uh, primary figure in the story, the very controversial Unity Mitford, and why did you decide to base the story around her in such a compelling way? Well, Unity Mitford, <laughs> <laughs> Unity, let's, let's back up. The phrase Hitler's girl, mm -hmm. uh, the title of my book, um, was an actual headline in the British press. And I think it was, it's quite arresting even today. It is, it's um, startling. You see that and immediately questions come to mind. Who is this person? How could anybody be Hitler's girl? You know, the, we, some people know about Ava Braun, but you know, the idea that Unity Mitford, who is a British person, <laughs> had such a connection to Hitler is very alarming and intriguing to think about. Well, you know, it, it, it is. And I was so struck by it and equally struck by her full name, which is Unity Valkyrie Mitford, born in Swastika, Ontario. Now you can't make that up. <laughs> <You cannot. laughs> and perhaps this was her destiny, I don't know. But um, Unity's story, you know, Obviously, I'm an academic, but it was very important to me to write a book that was that people would read and that was made for an interesting story because history is illuminated by stories, some you know more palatable than others. But Unity's story, um, and hopefully, as I write it, united many different strands of an argument that I really was hoping to make about democratic backsliding and packaged it into and and she essentially packaged it into one pretty unsavory bundle um uh, although she was really quite extreme her fascination with hitler was shared by many other influential british citizens um there were anglo-german fellowships um there were delegations that i write about that went from britain that attended the 1936 olympics but um, through, through my research, it was really only unity. Mitford, of all of this wide array of, of British potential sympathizers and, and, and non-objectors to, to the rise of fascism in Britain in the 1930s, it was really only unity who met with Hitler as far as my research um, has informed me, over 160 times. And what's equally interesting is nobody did much about it. They knew about it, the mm -hmm. press followed her, they chronicled her, they exclaimed that she was Hitler's girl. Um, but that was kind of the extent of it. She was celebrated. Um, and it, it, to me, it made it for an amazing story. <laughs> Well, I definitely want to ask you and push a bit more on that point, but Unity comes from a very colorful family and a controversial family. The Mitford sisters, each of them in their own right, were either famous or notorious, depending on who you ask and what their role was. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more kind of where she fits in this really fascinating family at the height of British aristocracy. So the Mitford children were kind of a group of them unto their own. Um, their parents, their father, Lord Reedsdale, um, he was known as Lord Reedsdale, was a pretty right wing fellow. He was a member of the House of Lords. Um, he was a member of the right group, which I write about, which was an extremist group um, that I and 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 a, and a pro German group that was um, part of a, of a very secretly guarded um, roster of members uh, during the 1930s. But there was a wide range, or there was more of a range amongst the children. So there was unity who was sent to boarding school in Germany, which wouldn't have been unusual for a society, an aristocratic girl during that time. Um, her sister, 
it, one of her sisters was Diana Mitford, who was married to Brian Guinness, one of the famous Guinness, the sons of the Guinness um, brewing fortune, um, and left him and two small children to carry on an affair with Oswald Mosley, who was the head of the British Union of Fascists, and eventually married Mosley at the home of... Um, I'm thinking it's Himmler. I want to think back whose house it actually was. Um, but you know, with with Hitler attending in attendance. Um, but Diana and Mosley only actually met Hitler because of of Diana's sister Unity. There was Nancy Mitford who wrote Wigs on the Green that I write about. She was a pretty famous author. Um, she actually made fun of them. There was Jessica Mitford who was a communist. I mean, they were all over the map. And then there was one brother who sadly died during the war, um, who was also probably pretty much of a supporter of Germany as well. Um, and they were well known in the press and they were celebrated for their idiosyncrasies, some of which if you read when you read my book, I argue are, you know, much more than idiosyncrasies, much more than idiosyncrasies. Absolutely. Well, this idea of kind of the fascination and flirtation with Germany and authoritarianism is something that was shared not only in the British upper class, but also you can see it in the American elite too. Um, and Joe Kennedy was the ambassador to Britain. His son, Joe Kennedy Jr., goes on a tour of Europe and comes back fascinated by and finding a lot to compliment about that authoritarian system. But Unity was really unique in the kind of access that she had and access that she really forced in a way. She kind of inserted herself into that world. And so she has these repeated contacts with Hitler, as you emphasize, unlike anyone else. So can you describe for us a little bit more about what that kind of contact was? And was it just she was fascinated by and obsessed with Hitler? Or was there some sort of mutuality of this relationship? Was she really Hitler's lover? Well, um, we might never know. Uh, she definitely, as a young student, went to German, you know, went to boarding school, went to a finishing school, and uh, very quickly figured out where Hitler had lunch every day. And she would sit in that restaurant and staked him out until he had literally invited her to join his table. And this relationship progressed um, to the point where she introduced and 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 very oddly he would write that he he physically she was tall and blonde i mean she was over six feet tall she was blonde with blue eyes i mean she was a perfect aryan except that she was british and not german um so it did, did seem to be quite mutual um their relationship for a long time at least in the beginning. And he included her on trips. Um, as I mentioned, she or probably organized the wedding that he attended for Oz between her sister and Oswald Mosley. Um, but there was more to it. And how much more to it, how much more there was to it, we don't know unequivocally. Um, we know that something happened to her in 1939. Um, he had always told her that if war was declared on a large scale, that he would have to devote himself to that war and he would have less time for her. Um, there was a very famous postcard that went, that was handed kind of surreptitiously um, to her first biographer, David Price Jones, um, which in translations was said something, he called her Bobo which was a name that her sisters used for her as well, and or her, or her and her one brother. Um, and he said it's something to the effect that I'll always love you and you will always be in my heart. And this, this um, postcard was kept by her mother and kind of hidden for years and eventually showed up with with this biographer David Price Jones, um, but we don't know really what happened. Um, I write about speculation of her being repatriated um, and what may or may not have happened to her. 
as a result. Um, we know that when she was ill and some, some event did happen in 1939, they say it was a suicide attempt um, from a gun that Hitler had given her as a gift to protect herself, um, that Hitler left the front and went to her hospital room and sat with her and sent her flowers. And whenever she was ill before that, would send his doctors. He was apparently on a re regime of 15 injections a day. And he would send these injections to her if she had the flu. And, you know, but he was intimately involved with her convalescence from whatever happened to her. Could, and could you just range, tell us oh, a little bit more about the circumstances around that, the mystery surrounding it, and you know, what may or may not have driven her to that attempted suicide? Well, she was, um, so 19th, September 1st, 1939, Britain declares war. And she went to the, the story is she went to the English gardens and put this little pearl handled pistol to her head and shot herself in the, in, in the temple. And by some luck there, she was near a, either a police station or she was being staked out by Nazi guards because she was very quickly taken to the hospital and where she stayed for a while. Um, but her family was never notified. And it was really interesting that nobody really knew that she was in hospital in England for several months. And when they found out, they, you know, one uncle made a comment, and I write about this, that she's really okay. And there was, wasn't much to worry about. She was going to be fine. Um, but there was other speculation that I came across in the archives that maybe she had gotten so close to Hitler that those around him wanted to get her out of the way and that they, they had shot her. Um, there was some speculation that they that that, Hit, that Unity and Hitler had had a fight and that she had taken a, an overdose of a barbiturate. Um, there were a range of explanations of what may or may not have happened to her. But um, what did happen is that it caused, put into motion her repatriation to, to England, um, which was something that she had promised that she would never do. I mean, she, um, and it's very funny, there's a correspondence um, with between the, the British embassy in Munich and the home office in, um, in London saying, everybody's going home, but Unity Mitford, who's, who said that she's staying forever, you know, despite the war breaking out. Um, so we don't know really what happened to her, um, except we do know from the MI5 agent who was on duty at Folkestone Harbor when her when her boat came, um, and and you know there was a series of events that we can talk about that that didn't happen um, when she was repatriated. But if and I included one picture of her um, to go back to your question of what happened um, from some newsreel footage of her coming taken off the boat and she's on a stretcher and a blanket's pulled up to about her neck, and but her hair is perfectly done. She has a lovely bob. And for someone who shot her, had supposedly shot herself in the head, there was no evidence of a gunshot wound. And the head of MI5, Guy Liddell, who fortuitously kept a, a um, diary that was classified until about, oh, the mid 2010s um, for a variety of reasons, wrote at the time that he did not believe that she had sustained a gunshot wound. So, so, so much mystery surrounding it. So while we're on the subject of mystery and cloak and dagger and MI5, I find the history of intelligence fascinating, especially in this period as modern intelligence agencies are only just starting to take root in the way that we know of them today. And you think of the panache and this kind of uh, perfidious Albion character of the British Secret Service and MI5 and MI6. And so it feels that there's this perfect opportunity that the British government has before the war breaks out to have a source who's very well placed in Hitler's inner circle. And so did they try to take any advantage of Unity's position to gain information about Hitler and his true intentions prior to the war? And if not, why not? 
So it's one of the central questions in my book and, and, a, and a real question to me to this day um, was the failure of the British government to use unity's access to Hitler to their own benefit. Um, additionally, um, a long list of right-wing sympathizers, including Unity's sister, were put in prison for treason, for doing a lot less than Unity has had, had ostensibly done. Um, but Unity, there was really, there were calls for her to be imprisoned, um, but nothing ever resulted, nothing ever happened in that regard. Um, I think there are a few reasons potentially why Unity was never prosecuted. Um, although her case was debated in Parliament and forcefully defended, might I add, um, one excuse was at the time her weak state of health due to the alleged suicide attempt, um, although it took months to corroborate her condition with a medical examination, but it was also conceivable that Unity was protected by a powerful cabal that that supported Hitler. And, you know, part of the policy of appeasement, um, the, the government tolerated a lot of what happened and maybe, you know, weren't so philosophically, politically inclined to look into the ramifications of what she was doing and, and to, to the benefit of, of defending British democracy. Um, it, it, there are a lot of open questions uh, that, are, that are still central, I think, to our study of this period. Fascinating. But it, unity is you know, one story that frames a broader story that you illustrate and illuminate here. But there is also kind of, as you talk about in the book, a somewhat of a limit also to how much the British government and the British people are, of course, eventually willing to you know, look the other way or to carry out appeasement. And there does start to be pushback and pressure even amongst the upper classes, including the very height, <laughs> the British upper classes, uh, and that in the form of Wallace and Edward. And of course, there is this historical connection between the British royal family and Germany, their roots are German originally. Um, but Edward in particular is such a fascinating figure. And you've written that his abdication may have actually had more to do with his Nazi sympathies rather than his choice of a wife of the American divorcee Wallace Simpson. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, yes. So Edward considered himself to be German. And there were famous stories that when everybody left the party, a party at the palace, um, Edward was speaking German. He was not even necessarily speaking English. Um, and there's speculation in it, and it's supported in the archives that, well, two things. First, it was there's there's a lot of speculation that Wallace Simpson um, was a Nazi sympathizer, that she was having an affair with von Ribbentrop, who at the time was the German ambassador to the court of St. James. Um, there's a famous story um, corroborated by a florist <laughs> that uh, Ribbentrop would send um, Wallace 13 carnations, red carnations every day uh, to commemorate the time, the, the nights that they had spent together. Um, we don't really know. Um, but what we do know is that Hitler was well aware of Edward's affinity towards Germany and his desire. He felt that he was unjustly forced to abdicate and he, he really wanted to return to the throne. So when they left the south of France um, and arrived in Nazi controlled Spain and Portugal in 1940, it presented the Nazis with an opportunity to recruit Edward and, and Wallace. And the Nazi high command really at Hitler's direction made direct overtures to Edward um, offering to reinstate him as the King of England when Germany won the war. And Churchill, to his credit, understood very well what uh, Edward's vulnerability was to the Nazi regime and uh, sent them to the furthest reaches of the British Commonwealth as governor of the Bahamas, where they spent 
the rest of the war um, far away from any Nazi temptations. Um, and this, interestingly, this episode of this 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 recruitment, this potential recruitment of of Edward in it was it happened in in Madrid and in Lisbon, was so powerful that a, a a mark on British democracy that Churchill classified it and reclassified it. And there's a series as late as the early 1950s. So he did not want this information to get out. Um, I think he considered it to be very explosive. Yeah. Well, Churchill's perceptiveness in this time is so, there's the, of course, the kind of the overall story of Churchill was a voice alone in the wilderness, kind of warning against the rise of authoritarianism and Nazism um, on the continent. And he's you know, very early a skeptic. He doesn't send his daughter to school in Germany. He sends her to France instead. Um, he, you know, in my work, you know, he does is a little concerned about his daughter Sarah marrying an Austrian national in case war breaks out. And so there is, but Churchill is not the only voice at the time, but for a while, he's in a very distinct minority, which your work really points out, which is um, so fascinating to think kind of of the people who are in the inner circle of whether, you know, in hindsight, they'll say, well, I was here to try to protect the institution and to do what I could from the inside and to work with the structures that are in place at the time. And how much of that is really true and how much of that is that just kind of trying to protect reputation later? Well, you know, if you read the correspondence um, in the 1950s, so this file famously is called the Marburg file um, about Edward. And there was a US publisher in about 1953 who wanted to publish it. And Churchill was on it immediately. And there's a big correspondence um, of him, you know, imploring. He went to the head to, to the president of France. You know, he was, he really understood how close Britain had come. And it wasn't just Edward. I mean, it was more complex than Edward, but I think to Churchill and from my understanding of what I've read in the archives, it was emblematic. This flirtation by the former King of England was emblematic. You know, all, you know, Edward and Wallace also, when they first got married in 1937, took a trip to visit Hitler and to visit Nazi Germany, they toured a concentration camp that was, you know, repopulated by Nazi guards. They removed all the prisoners and everything looked, you know, very jolly to, to them. You know, Unity Mitford and her, and I think Diana also visited, you know, they're Britons who visited concentration camps, if you can imagine, during the period of the 1930s. And of um, course the Olympics, kind of covering them for the very blatant anti-Semitism. They're taking away the public signs, both the Winter Olympics in 1936 and the Summer Olympics where foreign travelers come and they're so impressed by the efficiencies and the economic opportunities and just the, the construction and the, uh, the German engineering because it's deliberately been obscured. And the parties. Yes. The parties were remarkable. And, you know, my travelers wrote that, that I write about, mm -hmm. um, wrote about these incredibly elaborate parties with, you know, lines of, of, of fire bearers and fireworks and dancers and, you know, everything you can imagine. This was the Nazis coming out party in 19. Mm -hmm. 30, the 1936 Olympics, you know, we had Lenny Riefenstahl making film about it, you know, glorifying the glorification yes. of the of the German form. We had these, the, the you know, the Olympic Stadium, you know, this was, you know, it, it's very interesting the way the Nazis used visual culture and propaganda, Absolutely. which we know about. In, um, in my undergrad, I took a class on uh, the cinema of the Third Reich, and that is one of the, the classes I took that was most impactful during my time at Harvard as an undergrad because of this utilization of the medium of film in a way that nobody else had really captured yet, and both the power in the... Um, Kind of the incredible things that film can do, but then also the very frightening things that film can do and how the nerd, the Third Reich Nazi cinema force was so controlled and such a coordinated message, whether it's these quasi documentaries or reinterpretations of American films to support a Nazi message. 
And so with all of the kind of the smoke and mirrors going on, were these travelers, you know, uh, or even, you know, someone like Edward or Wallace, are they just not smart? Are they willfully blind? Or do the Nazis do such a good job of obscuring what they really intend that, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that a visitor at the time could have walked away with that impression? You know, we don't know. But what we do know is that Nazi propaganda was really very well developed. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, visual culture. And I insist on this, you know, when I speak about the period, because we live at a time where visual culture really impacts our politics as well. So this is, you know, not something that I, I, I offer as an idea lightly, but I don't think I, I do think it's very impactful. I mean, they were they were putting up exhibitions in the 30s of accepted art, of degenerate art, of um, of images of Jewish faces, of Aryan figures, and they were displaying all of this, these exhibitions, one next to another. And people would attend them in the middle of the winter and queue outside for hours to be able to see both sides of the coin. I mean, the Nazis were really masters at this. And um, we have a lot to learn about the, the relevance of visual culture and the power of visual culture in our world today. Um, I, I don't think that we can underestimate that. And, and I do think it was incredibly seductive, you know, to British travelers, to, Brit you know, these Britons who were ceremoniously, you know, Britons who were powerful Britons, who were ceremoniously invited and wined and dined and shown these images of the power of the Reich and what it was, um, was very appealing to Absolutely. people. Well, you mentioned kind of the things that we can learn about our own times today through the lens of history. So let's talk about that a little bit more directly. Your book makes such a timely and important contribution to that conversation. And one of the things that we hear a lot, especially, you know, as a law student, this is something I hear about, about democratic erosion, democratic backsliding. And you've written that every small assault on democracy counted in pushing the momentum away from a shared sense of Western democratic values. So what does that mean to you, both as a historian and as somebody commenting on and looking at history and applying that to our world today? How like the 1930s is this moment? Look, it would be unfair and overly simple to tell you that the correlation is perfect, but I do believe that history provides us with a roadmap to understand our world today. And it especially requires us to look at familiar events with a fresh set of eyes and, and questions. The period of the 1930s in Britain challenges really our understanding of Britain as a bulwark of democracy. And my research has shown that a broad segment of society was at the very, at the very least complacent and more likely complicit. Um, in a slow burn of what I like to think of call a slow burn of democratic erosion um, as British aristoc as British democracy um, really turned on the head of the pin of a pin. And I hope that my book successfully argues that we have similar warning flares um, about democratic challenges in our world today, which we choose to overlook at great risk. And from the point of view of Britain on the eve of the Second World War, we're reminded um, that democracy is not necessarily our legacy. And, you know, that's an important conclusion, mm -hmm. I think, as we look at this, at this period um, from the lens of today's challenges. Absolutely. If you had to kind of leave the readers or the listeners today with a couple of specific takeaways from what your work, both as a historian and an academic, focusing on security and foreign relations, kind of what are several concrete takeaways that you hope people, um, kind of they, they can glean from your work um, and apply that to the way that they think about democracy and fighting to protect and preserve democracy in our times? Well, the question that I hope read, read, readers will recognize is that we are faced today with many similar challenges and that democracy eventually succeeded in Britain during this period, but will today's world be 
similarly successful or will it require a cataclysmic event like the Second World War in order to reassess and ensure the survival of our democracy? You know, there are times when we've come together. Um, I think of post 9-11, I was actually in England um, during that time, but I understand that in America, people came together post 9-11. I think COVID was an opportunity, you know, a global pandemic for people to come together and it didn't happen necessarily. We're very polarized today. Um, but the political debate about the demise of the liberal world order of the 20th century is becoming increasingly an urgent topic. And there are challenges to democracy that we see today, not just in the US, but um, in Europe and the developing world. And I hope that this book will serve as both a challenge and a warning um, to inform a similarly treacherous moment in, in our history. Um, I think that we should really be thinking about this more. And, and I would hope that that's, that's a takeaway from my book. Absolutely. Well, before we open it up to questions, I just want to ask you a few more myself. <laughs> and uh, I would also love to, to get your thoughts on kind of the study of and the writing of history in general. So you and I both work in a similar time period, the late 1930s, World War II, kind of you know, edging up to the Cold War. And there is a lot that's written about this time period. There are a lot of books, there are a lot of movies, TV shows, and sometimes you encounter the argument where people say there's been so much study and writing about World War II, what could possibly be left to say? And I have my own opinion on that. I think that that is hogwash. I think there's always more to say. I think your book is proof of that. And I would love to get your opinion on whether that's, you know, the revelations of new sources, whether our own times make us think about the past differently. Why is it important to continue to study these topics and these periods that we think that we know so well? Well, I'm going to come up with a new response for you because you've, <laughs> you've come up with the top two. First of all, there's tons of, of information that's being de declassified all of the time. Um, so there, there is new information that comes to light. My book is, 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 is born of that new information. But what's especially new is the perspective, I believe, um, today from which we examine these issues and the necessity of the challenges that we're facing, you know, um, and this won't be new to any of but anyone in our audience, I don't think, is that this is, we have a generation that's growing up now, and these are my students who have never met a Holocaust survivor, who don't know anyone who served. I think there, I, I saw a figure yesterday, and I, I haven't verified it, that there are only, they estimate there are only about 10,000 soldiers left. American soldiers who would have fought in World War II. So there is a new importance that's placed on the secondary literature of the Holocaust and how we present that. And I would argue, unfortunately, the politicization of, of some of that, um, not of, of the literature, of Holocaust memorials, and this second ge this generation. Um, that we teach um, that's growing up as, as, as the new generation that hasn't had the primary contact with, with the wars um, have to be informed consumers mm -hmm. of the information that they're receiving. And I'm very mindful of that. I'm very mindful that we, that students and that visitors and that people understand that the platform of visiting Yad Vashem or the Museum of Jewish Heritage is very different from the message that you will get if you go to the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which doesn't call itself a Holocaust museum, or a concentration camp, or Auschwitz, for example, which is a Polish national memorial. This is all, you know, the information that we have today, and this is a very long answer, is really very important, and how we look at it mm -hmm. is what's new. Absolutely. And I mean, I kind of feel like I often find myself shocked when people's grandparents didn't fight in World War II because people are getting younger. Their grandparents were not born in the 1920s, you know, didn't fight in World War II. My grandfather was in the Navy during the war. And, you know, you talk to anybody, you know, even just a little bit younger than me that, you know, that's not the case is their grandparents were too young. And so not even having those stories with their own, with our, within our own families, I think, like you're saying, adds to the sense of urgency 
to understand those times, especially as there is so much resonance with the world today. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and then uh, I'm going to pose some of the questions that have been sent in by a wonderful audience. And my last question for you is, there's a lot to, when you look about, when you look at history, there is, of course, a lot of darkness. There are a lot of dark times. There were terrible things that happened, first and foremost, especially in the context of this conversation, the Holocaust, war. Um, it's, yeah, there's a, a lot to be concerned about. And of course, our world today is not perfect. But I do think that in the long trend over time, the world improves. People become better. They see the errors of the past. And I think the past can also be an illustration of where you can find hope, even in the dark times. So what does your work and your wonderful book, Hitler's Girl, tell us about where we can find optimism in looking at really complex and difficult moments from the past and how that can inform our outlook on the world today. So, you know, this idea of the best of times or the worst of times isn't, you know, and examining that isn't unique to us, mm -hmm. you, you know, in this moment that we're living in. Of course, I'm quoting Dickens, 1859, who himself was writing about the French Revolution of 1789. So there's, you know, this isn't new. Are our times good or are they bad? We've been asking ourselves these questions um, as part of our human consciousness for generations. And it's very important that we do this. So I, I, I think conversations like this with audiences who are virtually here with us, that people are interested in these conversations and that we're coming together and talking about this, these things is really very positive. Um, look, you know, the bright spots, I thought the, the midterm elections <laughs> and just a few weeks ago is a bright spot. Um, we are, the complexity of today's world is born of a moment that we're familiar with, and we know this from history, industrialization, innovation, um, implicitly disenfranchises some people, and that's when hate is born. Um, but industry, but but innovation is progress. And I think it's very important that we look at these issues and we don't forget that that's the lens and that we're aware of it and that we come together and that we discuss it and that it, the inexorable move forward of the human spirit has fits and starts, but overall represents great progress. Absolutely. So. Well, I'd love to end on a hopeful note there. So thank you so much for those fantastic thoughts and perspective. And now I'm going to ask you a couple of the questions that have come in from our audience. Um, uh, we have an audience member who's hoping that you could talk a little bit more about how you went about doing the archival research for the book and whether it was difficult to find sources. Well, no, because I lived in England and England is has a wonderful national archive where I did most of my research. Um, and it's actually very easy if you know where to look and you're very patient. So I would go, the archives are in Kew, um, just outside Fantastic of- Fantastic archive, I know it well. <laughs> which is, it's a wonderful place. Uh, people know Kew Gardens, but they don't necessarily know the national archives. And if you sit there long enough, um, they're incredibly helpful and there is a ton of information and it's uh, you have to see um, the files in front of you to realize how precious the information really is. You know, you can tell from the way the papers are folded, whether anybody has ever looked at what you're looking at before. Um, and a lot of the time the pages hadn't hadn't ever been bent. Um, so I did a lot of work at Q at the National Archive. I also um, did a lot of work and, and continue to work quite a bit at the Wiener Library on Russell Square um, in central London, which is the largest repository for Holocaust and genocide studies. And they have a remarkable collection um, where I, you know, if you're a researcher, you just don't get any happier than in either place. Absolutely. I always feel like archival research is like a treasure hunt. You never know what you're going to find. And there are so many of those moments where you'll go through 1500 pages in a day and then literally, and I've had this experience, I'm sure you have too, like the second to last thing you turn over is that gem that you've been searching and hoping for and hoping it exists. Um, and that always makes the process well worth it. 
Absolutely. <laughs> spoken from a true researcher. By a true <laughs> so we have a question from another audience member asking about how the Mitford descendants today view their relatives and the legacy of their family. Well, I only came across one and that was Deborah, the Duchess of Devonshire was um, the last surviving Mitford when I started my work. Um, on this book, and her her home was a place is a, and I say was a place because she's passed away since I I started my book, it was a place called Chatsworth House, and beautiful apparently place. it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And apparently Deborah had Unity's was in possession of Unity's only surviving diary. So of course I really wanted to get my hands on it, and. I was told summarily, and this wasn't the only place that they didn't have it and the libraries closed and they weren't interested in talking. And I had a similar experience at the Royal Archives of Windsor. And I went, you know, by then I was pretty wise to the situation. And I went sort of with my dustiest credentials as a university professor interested in the 1930s. You know, I tried to disguise everything. But I'd say that nobody really wants to talk about these topics very much from my experience. Well, it's always different when you put it in the context of family. You know, it's not some you know, arm's length view. Um, we're not always objective when it comes to our own family and kin, um, but it definitely does also remind us of the proximity of history and how the past is not that far away. Um, so another question that's come in from the audience asks about the differences between the um, perception of and the writing about unity in the English press and the German press. Is there a difference? And how is unity viewed in Germany today? That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure that unity is necessarily a topic in in Germany today. And, you know, my book went to the Frankfurt Book Fair this year and, you know, to be translated into German. And I've heard some really interesting things like German, the German press public publishing world prefers books about this period to be written by German authors. Yes. Um, and I don't know if that's true or not, but they're not much concerned by unity, I would say. Um, but there is interest by the German press in my book. So I did a, an interesting, um, interesting to me interview with Deutsche Welle, which is the largest English language German, it's a newspaper website. Um, and, and they were quite interested. So there is a lot of interest, I'd say, in the topic. I'm not sure if it's unity specific, um, but there's interest. I'm not sure what they think about unity specifically, though. I have two more questions from our audience, uh, and then I will turn it back over to Sydney. Um, so we'll uh, hopefully we can ask these both quickly. Um, I think we have time. Um, so somebody uh, writes, I love the use of Mussolini's quote, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, no nobody notices. Can you expand upon this viewpoint and how it illustrates the Nazi propaganda? Well, I'm not sure that it's Nazi propaganda or you know citizenry, citizenry writ large. So. The point that I was making with that is, you know, all of these small infractions uh, that people were willing to tolerate at the time, be it anti-Semitism, be it trips to Germany, be it, you know, the Hitler youth who toured England in 1936, a Boy Scout exchange that happened between um, Germany and England in the in at the end of the 1930s, you know, all of these flirtations, all of this seduction of Nazi Germany towards the British was like a feather. Each one was a flat feather being plucked. And at the end of the day, the chicken has no feathers. And guess what? Political ideology risks to be considerably different than how we like to think of it, you know, as, as a liberal, Britain as a liberal democracy. Absolutely. So I will uh, ask you one more question. And I think that this is one that can, that highlights both uh, you as a writer and also as a professor, as an educator. Um, I 
audience member asks, what other resources do you recommend to learn more about this time period and this subject? So if, if we are your, your class, we're your students at Yale, what do you advise that we read? <laughs> well, I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal this summer that answered <laughs> exactly that question. Um, and, you know, interestingly, part of the reason why I was so um, dead set on writing this book is there's very little written about fascist England. That's true. I mean, there's very little written about the 1930s relative to the importance of it, in my personal opinion, but. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's a much bigger conversation nice. too. But um, I go back to Hannah Arendt. Um, I, I would be reading The Origins of Totalitarianism as a start. I think she does a wonderful job. You know, she has another essay called On Refugees that talks about specifically about the vulnerabilities of people without a state. Um, I read, I, I recommend reading, um, well, Nancy Midford, Wigs on the Green, because she parodies in this book, Unity and her family and their fascist flirtations. I would recommend that. And nobody would know that as well as she does. Exactly. Um, and, and there are a few others, you know, Martin Pugh wrote a book about Mosley specifically, it's called uh, Hurrah to the Black Shirts. But the publication and the understanding of fascism in Britain has really been confined to Mosley. And there's so much more um, so we've discovered. Another audience member wrote in asking if your work was influenced all by Ian Kershaw's book, Making Friends with Hitler, and another that deals with this subject. Absolutely. I mean, it's that's a wonderful book. Um, Goldhagen also, um, Hitler's Willing Executioners, why people were so willing yeah. to follow the it's Nazi demands and not resist. Absolutely. I mean, so important for not only historical knowledge, but also self-awareness in our own times, whether that is, you know, the, we're contending with the rise of fascism, authoritarianism, uh, erosion of democracy, or just good things to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's not all doom and gloom. There's been certainly setbacks for authoritarianism in the recent uh, few weeks, and certainly in Russia, protests in China, Iran. And so it's a, a fascinating moment to think about both in our present and with the lens of history and that historical context. And your work is such a timely contribution to that conversation as we think about the global forces for our you know, politics, for governance, for democracy. So thank you so much for your contributions to that conversation and for this fantastic uh, array of ideas and uh, for having this discussion with me this evening. And thank you so much to the museum for hosting such a timely and important discussion.